The Arab world is a loose yet complex amalgamation of 22 countries in which a pan-Arab identity is the proclaimed ideal. Its citizens share a common language, a common history, and believe that they share a common destiny. But in its search for unity, Arab society has been pulled in opposite directions. Past versus present, sacred versus secular, monarchy versus democracy. The struggle to keep Palestine, the homeland of the Palestinian Arab people, an inseparable part of the greater Arab nation, became one of the main issues at the heart of the question of Arab unity. And with the creation of Israel in 1948, the two states envisaged in the United Nations Partition Plan did not come into being. Over half of the Palestinian population fled or were expelled. Could Arab unity be forged through war against a common enemy? The Arab-Israeli War of 1948 was considered a low point in the modern history of the Arabs. But with the rise of Jamal Abdel Nasser, the Arab unity movement reached its highest peak. Western colonial powers were expelled from the Arab world, countries were merging, and pro-Western regimes teetered on the brink of collapse. For a brief moment, the jubilant masses believed that those they considered to be the enemies of Arab unity were about to fall. It was a revolutionary moment in the Middle East. During this period, the recovery of Palestine took a back seat. Many Arab states, troubled by immense economic burdens, did not have the means to assume the burdens of their neighbors, especially the weighty load of Palestine. By the early 60s, even Egypt could no longer assume the sole guardianship of the Arab cause, having sent tens of thousands of troops to defend secular unity against monarchy in Yemen. The Palestinians found themselves still living in camps almost two decades after the war of 1948. New solutions were needed. The Palestinians began to think about solving their problem by themselves. You had the emergence of secret organizations, Palestinian organizations vowed to take into their hands the question of liberating their country rather than uh, uh, allotting it to uh, people like Abdel Nasser. Frustration at Arab inaction led to the creation of the Palestinian Liberation Organization in 1964. Formed as an umbrella organization by refugee groups, student organizations, and commando forces like Al Fatah, the PLO was dedicated to mobilizing the Palestinian people to recover their occupied homes and replace Israel with a secular Palestinian state. From early 1965, the PLO through Fatah pursued a consistent policy of border attacks, particularly along the Jordanian and Lebanese borders, forcing both Israel and the Arab states into a high military alert. This cycle of action and retaliation as well as American and Soviet interference in the region, gradually led to an escalation of tension. The crisis came to a head in 1967, when Egypt blockaded the Gulf of Aqaba, a vital transport route for Israeli shipping. Israel, who had been preparing for just such an occasion, attacked Egypt and its allies in a preemptive strike occupying what remained of Palestine. In six days, they seized the West Bank and Jerusalem from the Jordanians, Gaza and Sinai from the Egyptians, and the Golan Heights from the Syrians. We were training for this operation for years before 1967. The idea was to destroy the Arab air forces on the ground in order to gain air superiority. 
This is no secret. We were training for this for a long time. The Arabs were shocked. Most assumed that they had been strengthened, not weakened by nearly two decades of social revolution and the militarization of politics under the banner of Arab nationalism. A new wave of Palestinian refugees flooded into the already crowded camps. Nationalist leaders who had proclaimed for decades that Palestine would once again belong to the Arabs began to lose their appeal. The PLO and especially the armed guerrilla movement Fatah became the dominant force in Palestinian politics after the 67 war, setting up bases in camps around the Arab world under the charismatic leadership of Yasser Arafat. You have a newcomer to the Arab scene, which are the uh, armed organizations of the Palestinian people who presented a totally new vision, uh, if you compare to Abdel Nasser, rather than the liberation of Palestine will come through unity. The uh, Palestinian uh, Fatah organization uh, reversed the uh, formula to say that unity will come through the liberation of, uh, of Palestine. Full-fledged Palestinian mobilization began in Jordan, which unlike any other Arab country, had given Palestinian refugees rights and citizenship. From day one, Palestinian established and developed the Jordanian kingdom, from the royal palace to the government, to the institution, to the ministries, not only because they were refugees, because they were the skills educated group who succeeded in establishing what became Jordan. And this brotherly close relationship between Jordan and Palestinian encouraged the monarchy to demand their rights. The Palestinians living in Jordan for two decades began to ask for power sharing and more authority, as well as complete autonomy in the border areas with Israel. King Hussein of Jordan went a long way to meet these demands, but times had changed. September 1970 is seen today as one of the worst moments of inter-Arab relations, a series of incidents culminating in the hijacking of three planes by various Palestinian military groups were viewed by King Hussein as a direct threat to his authority in Jordan. Like September 1970 is the name given to the uh, confrontation between the army of King Hussein of Jordan and the Palestinian Fidaeen in, uh, in Jordan. Uh, it, was, it was to end a state of dual power Fighters under the command of Yasser Arafat clashed in a bitter civil war with the Jordanian army, claiming they were not being allowed to use Jordan as a base to launch attacks on Israel. Their attempted coup d'etat failed, and the Jordanians exiled the Palestinian leadership and fighters to Lebanon. Of course, at that time, Abdel Nasser tried to salvage uh, what can be salvaged of the PLO. He managed, but uh, died of a heart attack in the process. There was no great solidarity, uh, official solidarity, with the uh, uh, Palestinians being crushed by, by King uh, Hussein, who, who, of course, had the support of all the Western powers and the tacit uh, uh, and obvious support of Israel. The issue of Palestine, which contributed at the beginning to enhancing the idea of Arab unity, contributed at the end to weakening Arab unity because the Palestinians, through Fatah, decided they wanted to play the major role in liberating their country. And in pursuing this goal, they literally pushed Arabs away. Dr. Labib Kamhawi became a refugee after the 67 defeat. He firmly believes that Arab nationalism and not Palestinian nationalism is the answer to resolving the problem of Palestine. I always felt I am uh, an Arab Palestinian. Uh, and this is why I did not become uh, Fatah. Because Fatah philosophy uh, called for uh, priority that should go to the Palestinian struggle, Palestinian issue, and should be conducted by 
Palestinian people directly. I always felt that the threat that hit Palestine is only the beginning. It will hit the other Arab countries. Dr. Kamhawi has filled his home with paintings of Palestine. The pictures are the work of artists from all over the region, a reflection of just how important Palestine is to all Arabs. The title is The Palestinian Dream. It depicts Jerusalem as it was more than 100 years ago. Everything around it is as it was before an Israeli uh, put a footstep on uh, Palestinian uh, land. People living on a piece of land can come to an agreement if there is no political ideology governing one at the expense of the other or the use of arms, the power that is enabling one party to enforce its will on the others. One of the defining features of the post-1967 defeat was the debate concerning how Arab states should deal with Israel. But more importantly, how far could the meaning of Arab unity be stretched? Although no one denounced the idea of unification, conservative Arab states like Jordan and Saudi Arabia portrayed the defeat as the tragic result of inter-Arab rivalries and Arab nationalism's unwillingness to recognize individual state sovereignty. Israel uh, was many years as an excuse uh, for, the, for the Arab uh, countries that they need to, um, uh, to unite them. Only they need, to, but they didn't do it. They didn't do it because the competition between them was much, much stronger than the desire to have a unity. Although the unity debate continued throughout the late 60s and early 70s, Arab leaders threatened war, predicting that they would soon reclaim Arab lands and dignity. Such proclamations grew increasingly stale as the years passed and the battle was nowhere in sight. But on October 6, 1973, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat ordered a meticulously planned strike. The Egyptian army crossed the Suez Canal and advanced into Sinai. At the same time, President Hafez al-Assad ordered the Syrian army to attack the Golan Heights. Recapturing them, they began advancing towards the Israeli border. Israel was caught completely by surprise. Initial Israeli losses were quite heavy. After several weeks of fighting and a near conflict between the Soviets and Americans, the US forced Israel to accept a ceasefire on October the 24th. Although Egypt and Syria waged the war against Israel, Egypt broke the alliance in the war's aftermath. Behind the curtain of unity, Egypt had fought a strictly Egyptian war for the return of the Israeli-occupied Sinai. The big flaw in it was that uh, whereas President Hafez al-Assad imagined it as uh, a war to liberate the occupied territories of 67, uh, President Sadat imagined it as what he called a war to activate the peace process. Shocked by how close they came to being invaded, the Israelis were determined to negotiate a peace with Egypt. Arab states would now face the challenge of coordinating their post-war strategies. But the question was, would they do so unilaterally or collectively? President Sadat emerged from the 1973 war, believing that reclaiming the occupied territories would have to come through diplomatic negotiations and not through any more military encounters. It has been said that the lead for this idea of a war that will activate peace was taken uh, by Sadat from Henry Kissinger, Secretary of uh, State for the United States. 
President Sadat spent the next few years challenging the meaning of Arab nationalism, asserting his prerogative to negotiate with the Israelis by being the first Arab leader to visit Israel. Which will be signed by President Sadat and Prime Minister Begin. Finally, in 1979, Egypt signed a peace treaty known as the Camp David Accords, recognizing the state of Israel. Having done that, there was a small window open, which Sadat did not succeed in keeping them open. The first window was for King Hussein, who was sitting in London, waiting for an invitation. He never received it. The second window is the recognition of the PLO, and Arafat wait, was waiting for that recognition. Both were a setback in Camp David. That was a setback in the Arab movement. That was a setback in Arab unity. Arabs were outraged by Camp David. Sadat was accused of betraying and dividing the Arab nation. The Arab League ostracized Egypt by suspending its membership and moving the headquarters to Tunisia. Egypt, the leader of Arab unity for two decades, suddenly found itself on the outside of Arabism, looking in. Once we have an agreement for, uh, for and, and, and we have a, a peace treaty with Egypt, with the mother of the Arab countries, for us it was a breakthrough. And uh, the entire campaign, the entire struggle, Palestinian struggle and Arab struggle against Israel, were doomed to die. The Zionist movement were always interested in recognition from the Arab world and not from the Palestinians. They were always looking for an Arab leader. Go back to Faisal Wiseman talks. Go back to Abdullah uh, Golda Meir talks. Go back even to King Hussein and Rabin talks. All the, all the attempts of Ben-Gurion with Jamal Abdel Nasser, which failed in, in, in Paris, in France, in the early 50s. All these attempts by the Zionist movement were looking for Arab recognition of a Jewish state in Palestine on the expenses of the Palestinians. In October 1981, during a military parade celebrating Egypt's 1952 revolution, Anwar Sadat was assassinated by members of Islamic Jihad. Betraying Arab unity came with a price. Camp David laid the foundation of a unilateral peace between each individual Arab country and, uh, and uh, Israel, which, uh, which would weaken uh, the Arab uh, collective bargaining power and transformed the whole Arab-Israeli conflict into a conflict over borders. The dispute between the Arab was the main cause uh, that the Palestinians lost their uh, uh, campaign or lost their struggle with Israel. Uh, Arafat used to say, to put all the blame on the, on the Arab countries. He used to say, we have the Palestinian problems because the Arab betray us. And uh, from the Palestinian point of view, I would, I would agree with him. The Madrid conference in 1991 symbolized another turning point in the slow fragmentation of Arab unity. Israelis, Syrians, Lebanese, Jordanians, and a Palestinian delegation met to negotiate a joint settlement. Though the Madrid conference was considered a failure, the reality of Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, once completely unthinkable, highlighted a fundamental shift in Arab thinking towards Israel. The Palestinian cause was being transformed from an ideological contest into an interstate conflict. And by 1993, Israel and the PLO unilaterally signed the Declaration of Principles in Oslo, formally recognizing each other's existence. In the long term, Oslo too was considered a failure. The Palestinians never became truly independent. Israeli troops largely remained in place and the Palestinian Authority was ultimately proven to be ineffectual. Soon, it seemed like the only outcome of the accord was a massive concrete separation wall. So, presence actually is affecting everyone's life. 
it's not affecting only my life. Uh, secondly, it has actually the, its physical effects on the, on the people, apart from the emotional effects on everyone, on every single Palestinian. Palestinian Nada Keresh owns an electronics store in the West Bank. Only a few meters from his shop, the wall has devastated his business. So the other side has another street for the Israelis, and this side is for the Palestinians. Mind you, the people who are on the other side, still Palestinians. In real fact, it doesn't separate Israeli from the Palestinians. It separates Palestinians from Palestinians. Because myself, I live just from the other side of the wall. Today, you have Arab unity only on one issue, which is to recognize Israel after the withdrawal to the 67 border. There is a clear decision by the, all of the Arab state, which say we are ready to recognize Israel and we are ready to have normalization with Israel. Only one condition, Israeli withdrawal to the 67 border, which is very difficult which is not, nobody said we, we have to go precisely to this um, meter here, meter there. It's open to negotiation, but I, I think it was an Israeli mistake not to accept it, not to welcome it, not to, to, to have a sort of positive response to this. And it's not, it's not the end of the story. We still can have it. For almost half a century, the problem of Palestine and the common enemy, Israel, united all Arabs. But the power generating that unity began to collapse after the 67 defeat. Arab states began to justify their choices by invoking their national interests and not Arab national destiny. As the reorganization of the Arab-Israeli conflict shifted from pan-Arab idealism to realism, one voice was raised in objection. The vacuum left by Arab disunity was quickly filled by religious movements determined to make Islam the only unifying factor in the Arab world.